Hey, I'm Courtney Coop. I am the head of Great Big Story. All month long, we've been celebrating our Great Big Planet and telling stories about the incredible people who are on a mission to protect and preserve our planet. So today, I'm really excited to be able to have a conversation uh, with two of those people and really dig into what it is that they do and what are ways that we all can kind of help give back to our Great Big Planet. So. Joining me, uh, Wes Larson, you are no uh, stranger to Great Big Story. You have been joining us all week long as our ambassador for Great Big Planet. Yeah. And you are our host of the series Mission Wild. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know Wes, uh, he is a wildlife conservationist and more specifically a bear biologist, yeah. which is the coolest job title in the <laughs> whole entire you. world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Lauren Singer, it's so nice to have you. Uh, you have really, for me, put a face and a human connection to the zero waste movement. I think you're most famous probably for being able to fit every single piece of garbage you've created over the past four years. Uh, six, is it six years? Seven, seven years. Okay, I can count. <laughs> Sorry, I should have just said seven. <laughs> that would have been a lot nicer. For the past seven years, which is even more mind boggling, uh, into that mason jar that is sitting near you. But that's really just the start. Uh, you do so much more for Zero Waste. You are the CEO of Package Free, uh, which is a shop in Brooklyn. And then you also have a site called Trash is for Tossers. Mm -hmm. So we call this conversation why I'm in it. So let's kind of take it all the way back to the very beginning for both of you. How did you first discover your love for the environment? I'm super curious about bear biologists. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, uh, I grew up in Montana, which was kind of a like a perfect place for a budding naturalist, I guess. Um, so yeah, I you know I was just always really fascinated with anything wild, anything that, especially anything that could hurt me. Uh, like the the dangerous animals were always the ones that were really fascinating to me, and I was lucky to have parents that really cultivated that in me. They saw that it was kind of the thing that I was most passionate about. Um, We'd go on lots of road trips and I'd always just like sit with my face pressed up against the glass, like pointing out every single animal I saw and like trying to identify it, usually getting it wrong, but still just being like really excited. So yeah, I think that was mostly it. Just uh, growing up in a place that kind of nurtured that and then also having family that saw how important it was to me and like, you know, checking out books for me. This was before the internet. So it was like, we'd go to the library and check out every single book. And then we, you know, my mom let me watch Discovery Channel every night. And it was just kind of this perfect storm of things that all came together that, that made me really fascinated in the natural world. How about you, Lon? Um, I didn't grow up with, like, a family that talked about sustainability or environmentalism. But I did grow up in a place where I was always playing outside. So I think I always had a connection to nature. Um, but... My senior year of high school, I read Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, um, which she was really the woman that like launched the environmental movement in the 1960s. And it was my first realization that people, human beings, are the only creatures on planet Earth that can do things that can mess up the world for every other thing that lives here. And it gave me this sense of one, fear, but two, like huge amounts of power that like realizing that I have the power as an individual to make choices that could either be positive or like incredibly negative for everyone. That's a very powerful thing. Um, and then I went into college and started, I actually went to college for journalism, um, but I, I promptly failed. Um, <laughs> I just like hated everything about it. And then, uh, was in environmental science because I had to take a science class and realized that I was just like front and center um, every day, was obsessed with talking about it, was obsessed with learning about it and kind of like you, like it was just the thing that I, it, it like came from my gut, it came from like my, my heart, everything mm. I thought about was like pertaining to something around the environment and um, I think that led into a million different paths that brought me to where I am now, but it was really just learning about the power of people to impact the world in a positive or negative way and, and taking responsibility for that and then uh, doing all the things that I did after. I think what's really interesting is you both talk about the impact at a, at a young age, whether that you were really young or as a teenager, and it just goes to show that the things that you learn at that time, you're impressionable, and it does stay with you 
And for you both, you took that passion and actually turned it into your profession. Um, when did you kind of decide to make that decision? Yeah, it was it was like a long it was a long road for me. But uh, when I was like when I was pretty young, still uh, there's this pond right next to where we grew up, and I'd go down there and I'd like catch frogs and turtles and snakes, and uh, I'd take them home for a few days, and like I had this tank, and I'd like sit there and watch them, and every once in a while I wanted to get lost in the house, and that's a whole different story that um, that my mom could talk about for hours, but. Uh, then, you know, I'd go release them, and it was this big kind of tradition for me, and it's what I did all summer. And there's a certain species of frog. It was a leopard frog that, like, was kind of the frog that I would always catch. And there's just, like, tons of them at this pond. And by the time I was 10, they were completely gone. There wasn't a single one left. And uh, I think that was, like, kind of like a gut check for me as, like, a kid, like, realizing that things are finite and that, you know, that we can really affect things. And I talked to some people... Um, in the community and they talked about you know the ozone layer and how frogs are really uh, susceptible to changes in environment and there's like a certain type of fungus that that comes in and wipes them out and so it like this thing that I cared about this thing that like was a big part of my life like it feels weird to say that a frog was a big part of my life but it was uh, was suddenly like ripped away from me and that's probably when I first kind of realized what conservation meant and that like that it was even something that we needed. Um, and from there, I kind of, you know, I went to college and and kind of went down this track where I was like, I need to make more money. I need to do something that's practical that, you know, will help me to raise a family. And then, um, so I went down an optometry route and hated it and just kind of every single day felt like I was losing a little bit of my soul. And, and then I, so I quit and I um, went and met with a professor who um, worked with bears and they'd always been of special interest to me. And I went and bugged him every day for like a year, and a, or not every day, every week for probably like a year and a half until he finally gave me a job. And since then it's, yeah, it's been kind of my whole life. So we're, we're really lucky that you guys didn't become journalists yeah. or <laughs> optometrists. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be pretty miserable if I was an optometrist right now. But for all those optometrists out there, it's great what you're doing. Thank you, because yeah. I'm, I'm very blind <laughs> yeah, optometrist, yeah. so I appreciate We appreciate you. optometrists. Yeah. Uh, Lauren, I'm, I'm fascinated by just the concept of zero waste, and I'm sure it, the people come up to you constantly and are just insanely curious about it. But it's because it's a really big idea, and it's a really hard thing to wrap your brain around. So explain to me kind of how you see zero waste. What does it mean for you? What does your day to day look like? So zero waste seems really scary from a zoomed out perspective because it's like when people think about it, they're taking themselves where they are now mm -hmm. and trying to impose like nothingness on it, which is very weird to be like, okay, I have all of this stuff and make all this trash and then like tomorrow I'll have none. And that's confusing and seems overwhelming and impossible and blah, 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 but like, that's not how it works. Um, zero waste for me started first with reducing the amount of plastic that I was using. That's kind of how I got into zero waste. It was because I was protesting against the oil and gas industry and really passionate about um, anti-hydrofracking and realized through a series of events that I was a huge hypocrite, that I was using plastic multiple times per day, multiple touch points per day from the food that I was eating and buying to my beauty products that were packaged in plastic, my cleaning products, my clothing, which was predominantly petrochemical based fabrics. I was participating in fast fashion, which is why it's it's so often so cheap. Um, there was a huge misalignment between the way that I was living my life and the things that I was incredibly passionate about. And so that's when I realized I had to make a change and, and that change was first reducing the amount of plastic that I was using. And then um, that turned into realizing that I couldn't buy my way out of using plastic. You can't walk into a pharmacy and buy your daily routine without plastic. Um, so I had to start making a lot of my own products. So I started with toothpaste and then went into body lotion and deodorant and cleaning products. And through that, I learned about the concept of zero waste. And it was to me like the most amazing, the most empowering, the coolest thing that I had ever heard. Because up until that point, I was like yelling at every building, lobbying every politician, organizing every rally, trying to like scream at the world and be like change. And that's so ineffective. I mean, it's important, but not 
incredibly effective, especially when I was also contributing to the problem that I was fighting against. Yeah. So zero waste was my way to take responsibility for my personal impact on the planet and live my day-to-day -day life in alignment with my values for environmental sustainability. Um, and at first, people didn't know what I was doing or that I was doing anything different because my style stayed the same. My um, routine stayed the same. It was just I was making I was making different choices. But at the time, this was seven years ago, people didn't bring mason jars to fill up their coffee and they didn't, you know, like really compost and still not really. And, and so I'd start to get questions and that's why I started Trashes for Tossers because when you start talking about trash, and like personal impact, people can get really defensive um, because it feels like you're challenging and criticizing the way that somebody is living now, which isn't the case at all. Like we're all where we're at um, and with information, maybe we can make steps to reduce our waste. And so um, Trashes for Tossers was like a really safe place for people to learn about what I was doing in a way that felt like non-threatening and non-confrontational and non-judgmental. And then that kind of just grew, but I think living your values and like being an embodiment and like a version of confidence around an issue is a much more effective way at trying at making change. Mm. And Wes, conservation is also a really big mm -hmm. complicated issue to wrap your brain around. Yeah. So when it comes to you, what does conservation mean to you and how does it affect your day to day? Yeah, uh, it is. It's, it's like, I think, you know, in today's world where people really like to just kind of get surface of like a million different topics instead of kind of really diving into things. Conservation's become, you know, somewhat of a buzzword where it's kind of like something that's thrown out, but it's very vague and people often don't really understand the time and uh, effort that goes in towards like into actual wildlife conservation. So for me, um, it's kind of, you know, it's this long process. It's, it's rooted in tradition. There's this whole process of like, you know, you go out, you have a question in mind, a hypothesis that you need to answer. You go out and you study whatever species you might be studying and you try to answer that question. And then you publish a paper and that paper goes in the scientific literature. And that's kind of like the standard for conservation. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think, you know, with the changing world and a changing kind of media landscape, um, uh, you know, you kind of have to enter into this new era of outreach and kind of teaching people about the issues and letting people get involved in those issues. So there's new things that are kind of coming up like citizen science projects where people can actually get involved in their hometown or their home area in wildlife conservation. They can help researchers kind of gather that data that they need. Um, so it's it's like, that's a big question. It's one that's hard to answer kind of in a short blurb, mm -hmm. but there's, there's a lot of different ways that conservation is being carried out in a modern world. And one of them is just really education, just teaching people what those issues are and how they personally can help you know, with whatever animal might be imperiled. I think what you do is both the coolest and the most <laughs> dangerous and crazy thing I've ever, yeah. ever heard. Because, I mean, it's true. You are on what is essentially the front lines, mm -hmm. getting face to face with bears yeah. uh, in the name of studying them so that we can understand how to protect them. Yeah. But that means that you've put yourself in some crazy situations. Yeah, a couple. <laughs> Tell me more about that. <laughs> uh, like the one, the one that comes to mind, and uh, it's one that I talk about a lot because there was actually a, a National Geographic photographer with us when we went on this trip. But um, with I've, I did a project where we'd actually call our black bears. We put a GPS collar on them, and we we're learning kind of what habitats they're using, and trying to help them avoid um, campers around Bryce Canyon National Park. And uh, so this collaring process involved like catching a bear in a trap, putting a collar on it, and letting it go. But then in the winter, we'll actually go into their dens and while they're asleep and kind of check to make sure that collar is not too tight. Um, and they wake up, like they hear us coming, they wake up, they can pop out of their hibernation pretty quickly. And so it's pretty, like that can be kind of a scary thing. How big are bears? How many pounds? Yeah, of so these are black bears. Ferocious and animals. They, our black bears were anywhere from like 100 pounds to like 400 pounds. Um, so. Typically these dens are made kind of in like a shallow crevice in the rock and you can go up and I have a I have a pole that has a syringe on it and I just kind of poke the bear from outside with some ketamine and let the bear fall asleep and then I can pull it out and do whatever I need to do. But this particular day that we went with this photographer, we found this den and it was actually like 80 feet long. 
and it was this narrow tube and black. Yeah, and it's yeah, pitch black. As soon as I poke down with my headlamp, I see these two green eyes staring back at me from the back of the den. And it's my biggest bear. It was like a 400 pound male. And the males are a lot trickier to work with in the dens because they often they don't have cubs, so they're like prone to kind of just bust out and leave. Um, so I had to crawl in this den, and I'm like just inching towards this bear. It was just big enough for me. My little brother's behind me, and he's just like, "Don't do this! Don't do this! Don't do this!" He was kind of my helper, and I finally had to be like, "Shut up!" Like I need to. We need to get this bear. Its collar was getting really tight, so we wanted to make sure that it didn't tighten up too much on it. Um, and so we kept going, and the bear, like, and me, kind of had this little standoff. We have a yeah, we have a photo of it here. Uh, we had this little standoff, kind of in the I'm end, sorry, <laughs> in the end of the the end of the den, and uh, and I just kind of sat there and watched its behavior. <laughs> and so when they're like when they're aggressive, the bear will kind of do like a <laughs> noise, and it will shake its head, and it will clack its jaws and then they'll actually charge at you and kind of like um, let you know that it's like okay I'm a bear you're not supposed to be in here with me like you know you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing uh, but it didn't and it it actually let me pull out my syringe and sedate it um, which luckily like you know went pretty well and it was a really scary night it was like it was terrifying it's one of those things where it's like you wouldn't want to crawl in this this hole in the ground even knowing that there's like nothing there. So like knowing that there's a 400 pound predator at the end of it, like the one thing you don't want to be in there. Like I really had to suppress some like primal kind of instincts of like, get the hell out of here. Like you shouldn't be in here. So yeah, that was a really scary one. Yeah. So, so we call this conversation why I'm in it. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> listening to you both talk about what you do on a day to day basis. And you put yourself in harm's way and you make pretty big sacrifices and you dedicate a lot of time and neither one of you, what you're doing, it isn't easy. Yeah. So why do you do it? Do you want me to go first? Sure. That? Okay. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, kind of like what Lauren was saying earlier, like realizing that we're not alone on the planet and mm -hmm. realizing that we do have the intelligence and the power to affect everything else out there. Um, and, and for the most part, we've been doing it negatively. Uh, it, it makes me feel this like really intense responsibility to kind of give these animals a voice to, uh, to kind of, yeah, to, to let people know how we're affecting them. Um, I think people, you know, you see these programs and these documentaries where you see these wild places and it seems like everything kind of on the surface is okay. You know, where it's like, oh, like they have all this space and all these places where animals are thriving. And, and a lot of people don't know the truth and don't know that like literally every single species on this planet is being impacted by us. And, uh, and they don't have a way to kind of convey that to us. They can't tell us, you know, like, hey guys, like, mm -hmm. ease, like ease off all the plastic, like stop, you know, stop ruining everything. And, and so like me kind of being able to start having that knowledge, like I'm very new in my field, but being able to kind of learn that firsthand, uh, it makes me feel this kind of intense responsibility to spread that awareness. Hmm. How about you, Lon? I think for me, it's my, I mean, I, I have one, one goal in life, and it's to help to create large-scale positive environmental change. That's been my North Star since I was a freshman in college. Um, and everything that I do is about that, so I never know where that's going to take me, but but for like, I mean, people that are in the sustainability field are very much in it for very aligned reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I want to take responsibility for the impact that my species has on all the other species and um, help to share that message with other people and ultimately um, like maintain this like perfection that is the planet. But I think also it's less for the planet sometimes and more for humanity because if humans if we went extinct, the planet would be fine. I, I like to say that nature always prevails, and um, if we were gone, things would like snap back pretty quickly. It would look a little different, but it wouldn't. Um, nature wouldn't miss us so much. Mm -hmm. um, so I think humans are are really interesting and amazing, and I'd like to preserve our species. And I think just making people aware that like you have the power to, to eradicate your own species um, is an important message. Mm -hmm. And 
I guess like one, preserving the planet, but two, yeah, just keeping people around um, and helping them to live in a way that's in alignment with like this natural balance of earth and um, so they can keep creating and innovating and doing all the amazing things that people do without fucking it up for everyone else. (laughs) Well, you say part of the curiosity around zero waste is people can't, myself included, can't wrap their their brain around the lives that they are currently living today. Mm And that's been something, knowing I was going to talk to you guys, that I've been thinking about for myself a ton, which is I'm stubborn. I'm stuck in my ways. I have routine. I have habits. And there seems to be this mountain between the acknowledgement and recognizing everything that's wrong, but actually really doing something about it. Mm-hmm. Like th- that, that difference between knowing and doing is quite big. So when people ask me what the hardest thing about, like, living this lifestyle is i would say it's that exactly Mm. it's not the actual process of reducing your waste because it's just a lot of really tiny easy changes that add up over time but it's the the mental block the preconceived narratives and overcoming them to just start yeah that tends to be really difficult for people um like there's this preconception that sustainability is hard or elitist or expensive um those things can be true or not true. Um, but I've started living this lifestyle when I was a, a senior in college on a senior in color, college budget um, and executed it to a way where it worked for me, saved me money, I was eating healthier, my life completely improved, I found that I had more time. So it's overcoming those narratives and um, just just starting, just mm. doing like one little thing, whether it's saying no to plastic straws or saying no to plastic bags or doing something like composting or even just taking the time to think about what your waste is, looking in your garbage can, looking at what you're throwing away and just like, Step one is really taking responsibility. It's almost like in AA, it's like you have to recognize that you have a problem and mm. only then can you start making um, change and and make change that's actually like sustainable long term. Um, so yeah, that, that really is the hardest thing. It's just like I recognize that the way that I'm living isn't perfect and I commit to doing something about it even if i'm not perfect even if it's not like completely zero waste i'm committed to trying to make a more positive impact whatever shape that takes well and so i want to you don't have to dump it out but i want to kind of just point out your mason jar because you obviously are trying very very hard to eliminate waste from your life (laughs) but but it goes to show that there's even garbage that you can't avoid so when you look through this what are the things that you notice most often in there Well, because this is seven years old and when I really started doing this, sustainability wasn't really in the narrative like of popular culture. Mm -hmm. My my two choices when I graduated from college for a career were like government and nonprofit and there was no such thing as like sustainable CPG or like I don't know, there were no jobs in sustainability that were like cool or sexy or whatever. Um, and so a lot of these things that are in here now have solutions Mm -hmm. because starting companies to solve problems has become much more prevalent. Mission-driven companies are much more prevalent. Um, So the things that are in here are, it's all plastic, 100% plastic, um, and it's things that are not recyclable in municipal recycling. So there are solutions, like I could take this and give it all to um, this company called TerraCycle, whose motto is recycle everything, and um, this could all be turned into something else or recycled, but I hold on to it as just, a bit of information about what isn't conventionally municipally recyclable and the things that are created that are just stuff mm. that doesn't necessarily need to exist. So it's like festival bracelets. That's a huge one. If you've ever gone to a music festival, they give you those like little bracelets mm-hmm. and now they have like microchips in them, which is like even more extra. Um, there's plastic wrap, um, like saran wrap in there. Um, there's band-aids, but now we sell biodegradable bandages at Package Free. There's some gaffers tape for all you film people out there. Um, and then the things that connect a price tag of clothing to the piece of clothing, that, yeah. that little thingy, thing. yeah. whoever invented those, like probably so rich right now. Um, but they're just so archaic. Um, there has to be a better way to like put the price of an item Mm -hmm. on that item without needing two pieces of material. Um, uh, And then produce stickers, again, like a kind of archaic thing with all the technology that we have now. Um, So so yeah, I would say that's the predominance of it. And thin thin plastics, um, 
and just like the inner tags of clothing. So even if a piece of clothing is like totally natural, like 100% cotton, a lot of the times the wash labels are on synthetic yeah. so they won't fade through washing. So it's just these little tiny problems that you wouldn't think about when you think of like the giant trash problems. But even though they're small, they're, they're still problems. Mm -hmm. I am, um, you've motivated me to go through my own trash and just think about it. And for, for me, it's paper towels mm -hmm. uh, and coffee grinds, the two things. Yep. But I also am very fortunate that I live in a neighborhood where I can compost. So have kind of started doing that this, this paper weekend. Towels are such a good choice. That was like one of the first ones that my boyfriend started doing. He just started reducing his waste mm -hmm. and um, it's had like such a big impact because one, it just looks a lot nicer than having this like tall phallic looking thing on your countertop that's like just goes in the trash and two, it's cheaper and they, they just clean really well and you wash them. So it's like a really easy swap yeah. and um, I think it's a lot cuter. Yeah. I mean, Wes, what are you thinking about? One person can make a difference. One person can, can change something about what they do and how they live their lives. What, are, what is your recommendation? Yeah, uh, I mean, something I think about a lot is uh, uh, over, overfishing. So this is like, a, like a very conservation related issue, but one that doesn't get nearly as much kind of airtime, I guess, is you know, climate change and a few other, and they're all interconnected. But um, overfishing is one that really scares me and it's a problem that um, is like massive in scale and we're destroying you know, a huge percentage of our planet, the ecosystems there, by eating way too much fish. And so uh, something I stopped doing a long time ago was just, I just stopped eating seafood. Um, there are definitely sustainable options. There's places where you can get fish that was caught sustainably. Um, but I kind of hated being the person at the restaurant that was like, hey, where'd you catch this? How was mm -hmm. it caught? Where was it caught? And so I just decided to completely stop eating it. And, um, and I think people don't realize that like, you know, if you ordered, if you go to a sushi restaurant and you order bluefin tuna, you might as well be ordering like orangutan or, or white rhino or something like you're, Sad. yeah, you're essentially eating that same animal that's how endangered they are and that's you know and no one talks about it yeah and uh and it's such a huge industry i mean like one bluefin tuna in you know some of those like japanese fish markets will go for hundreds of thousands of dollars and so it's this huge industry with a ton of money behind it um and because it's a fish because it's this animal that we don't really um, have a connection to that we don't really like see ourselves in um people don't really talk about it i mean there's like Hundred like over a hundred million sharks every year sometimes are killed by you know shark finning. That's like the upper end of the estimate, but it's not you know it's not something that we can continue to do and still have a functioning ecosystem. And so that's one of those things that I think people can kind of take personal responsibility for. And if you do, I mean, if you're a sushi fan, great. If you love seafood, that's fine. You need to do it ethically. You need to ask those questions. Can you talk about like the like the top three no's and the top three yeses? Like if you are gonna eat seafood. Yeah, my my top couple no's would be sharks. Like I would never touch anything that has shark in it. They're Same. like yeah, they're an insanely important predator in the ecosystem, um, and they're they're a beautiful animal. They're like and they don't have the advantage of being like a dolphin or a whale or something mm -hmm. that we just naturally care about. People are scared of sharks, so we don't really care that they're being killed. So sharks, um, bluefin tuna, and uh, I'm drawing a blank on a third one for you. I'm just gonna do two for now. Shrimp. <laughs> shrimp, oh. yeah, shrimp's a big one too. <laughs> Honestly, anything that's farmed too in the ocean, uh, the fish farms are, are incredibly destructive. So I would say, yeah, I would say sharks, bluefin, and then farmed, farmed um, ocean farming. Uh, and then, what was your other question? Sorry. Some, some like okay ones. Like uh, if, you're, yeah. if you're wanting some ocean food. So the ones that I usually look for are kind of the aquaculture inland. Um, so like tilapia farms are often pretty sustainable. Um, Alaska has really good fisheries that are well regulated and, and have good quotas. So typically, if you caught if you have wild caught Alaskan salmon or whatever, you're pretty safe. Um, but there's apps out there, there's things that you can look at that you can take to the restaurant um, and it'll tell if that restaurant serves sustainable fish, it'll tell what kinds of fish you can order. Um, but it seems like a pain, but it's, it's one of those things that like, I've had sleepless nights thinking about what we're doing to our oceans and and, and we're going to notice the effects of it yeah. in our lifetime. Yeah. This isn't something that it's like, oh, my kids' kids will worry about that. This totally. Is, this is for us. So well, this is also, like 12 years. This yeah. is the, like, this is like yeah. I'm going to be like, I won't even be 40. I mean, some like some fisheries scientists 
you know, say that within 50 years, we might, we will lose all of our major fish stocks. Like, so there's, there's, and then on top of that, it's a human issue too, because there are whole cultures that depend on those fish Mm -hmm. and they can't catch the fish that they need anymore for their, you know, just for their, their daily kind of like nutrition, because we have these huge fleets of commercial vessels that are kind of just taking everything. And so it's a huge problem. It's one that I think, um, people can take personal accountability for just in their decisions they make with their diet. So we at Great Big Story like to say ripples make waves. Yeah. And so we can all be a ripple. We can yeah. all change one thing. Um, I don't want to end on a super downer of a note, yeah. even though this can be a downer of a conversation, but we like to tell stories that give people hope about the world that they live in. So where are you both seeing hope right now? For me, like, in. There's a really big bug on the floor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi, bud. Happy Earth Month. <laughs> on it. Um, yeah, it's cute. Um, kind of in so many places, and that's one of the reasons I started living a zero waste lifestyle was to take responsibility and realize that like I'm not gonna be depressed by the world around me, or like I I can't be allowed to be depressed about the world around me if I'm not doing everything in my power to help to change the things that I don't like in the world. And I think by focusing on my own impact and by focusing on the things that I can do, it's a much more positive narrative than trying to focus on all the things that aren't right. Um, I think educating yourself on all the problems is still really important, but knowing that in your day-to-day actions, you're you're helping to um, create a solution is really good. But like I mentioned before, like when I graduated, there were two career paths for somebody interested in sustainability. I guess also you could become a naturalist um, or like a scientist. Um, but even those jobs were were really hard to get and very competitive. And you had to go to upper school, so also very expensive. Um, but now, like you can fling your arm and hit like ten c- sustainable companies like in the face, which is really awesome. So that's hope. Hope in that you know, mainstream media is now talking about sustainability regularly um, in that like people that don't look like they'd care at all about sustainability because of the the preconceived narratives around what a person interested in sustainability should look like come up to me and say, I love your work or I love what you're doing. I'm interested in zero waste or I've gone zero waste. Like I had a businessman come up to me yesterday that looked like he would never even like stepped outside. And the fact that he says, I don't make trash now, like that is hope and it's in the little things, but the, the, the tide is changing. People are becoming more aware of their actions. And I think especially in this political climate, taking responsibility um, for their own actions and for their communities because they know that nobody else is gonna do it for them. And that's why I see so much hope. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, like, I would kind of just echo what Lauren said. And I think, um, I think the fact that we live in a world where people with a voice can kind of have their voice out there, they don't need to like, you know, we're really lucky to be doing something like this, but people can just get on their social media and kind of express their opinions. And um, there's people like Lauren who, you know, have like a big following and, and can really kind of preach their message to like a lot of people at once. I think that's a, a really important tool and something that um, that can be used for good and bad, you know, but uh, luckily a lot of people really are using it for good. And, and I'm encouraged too, just by, um, this feels weird to say, but I'm encouraged kind of by the way that some things in politics are going. I think kind of with the current political climate, people have seen um, kind of how big of an impact that can have. Like electing the right politicians is actually a really important thing. And, you know, electing the wrong ones can lead to a lot of huge problems and things that are really scary. And I think that's inspiring people to kind of um, A, you know, be personally responsible for their conduct and B, to like vote for politicians that that do care about the planet and do care about what we're doing. And it's good to see some of those politicians kind of getting pushed further away from that kind of middle of the road, like things like, let's just keep going along this path um, and really realizing that, you know, drastic action needs to be taken. So that's that's like a big thing for me is just, um, it's kind of people understanding that, that our legislators and our corporations need to take responsibility for their actions as well. And I do think people are really pushing them to do that, whether it's through their choices and kind of like making them realize there is a market in sustainability, there is a market in conservation, or just through, you know, electing people that are going to really kind of put the pins to them. Ben. Well, thank you guys both for joining me today. Uh, I, I think if anyone is just like me who needs more of that daily dose of motivation, 
to help get over the hump of wanting to do to actually doing. Following both of you guys on social media, as you mentioned, is is definitely uh, a way to get that. Uh, so trash is for tossers yes. uh, and, and Grizz Kid free and package free and Grizz Kid. Yeah. Um, I, so good. I think that's great. So uh, and if you enjoyed this conversation about the Great Big Planet uh, and want to see even more stories about the people who are who are joining that fight, definitely check out GreatBigStory.com. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> I want to go see some fair. Yeah. Like so badly. I have a